All right, we are continuing our three-week study this morning on Christian growth or Christian maturity. The first week, we focused on the relationship. Last week, we focused on the Word of God and the life of the believer, and this week is the Helper. Our main verse has been Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And we talked about this as talking about to be in a relationship uh, setting, to be strong in the Lord is to have a strong relationship with Him. Of course, to enter this relationship, somebody has to be born again. They have to have come to a saving faith. In Jesus, And we looked at John 3 and we looked at Numbers 21 where Jesus explained the need to be born again to Nicodemus. And there's three steps essentially to becoming born again. There's repentance, redemption, relationship. And so there's always these steps we walk through. Somebody doesn't need to understand those terms or the steps as they necessarily give their life to the Christ. But they turn from... Uh, Turn to the Lord is a better way of saying it. It's not just a turning from an old lifestyle. It's turning to the Lord. They place their faith in Christ for the remission of their sins. And then they enter into a relationship where the Spirit of God comes and dwells in them. And this is the essential part. Without this first part, uh, you can't grow. Dead people can't get stronger and uh, you can't get closer in a relationship that doesn't exist. You can't have a stronger marriage if you're not married. You can't grow stronger spiritually if you are not born again. This is one of the primary focuses, and, and, and the, our response we talked about within this is to love God. He brought us into this relationship because he loves us, for God so loved the world. And he says the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So this is a relationship, and the relationship God wants with us is just like the relationship you want with your spouse or with your friends. You love them, and you want them to love you back. In this relationship, we also talked about there's a roles. He's in charge, and we're not. He's the king. Uh, this is the essentials in Christian growth. Now, as we go over these different things, and we talked last week about our need to be in the Word, and, and this morning we're going to talk about the Helper, uh, the Holy Spirit, and about prayer. And these back to, these are all essential. These are uh, uh, foundations that are fixed for Christian growth. But being in the Word and striving after fellowship or time with the Spirit is only beneficial within that context of the relationship already being there. You have to be born again first. And within that, our motive needs to be right. Our motive needs to be because we love the Lord. Uh, and if you're a married person, you need more than just the correct actions to have a good marriage. Right? If I go into the uh, kitchen and I wash the dishes because I go, okay, one of my wife's love languages is serving. And so if I go in and I'm serving and I wash the dishes... Uh, it only is loving to her if I do it joyfully to her, right? Uh, same with if my wife makes me dinner or something. I appreciate it. It's a loving action. She doesn't have to do it, but it's a loving action. Uh, I appreciate it, but I appreciate more that she's thinking of me. And, and a good example of that is let's say she makes uh, this wonderful dinner, and she brings it uh, to the table, and she slams the plate down and says, here's your food. I'm not thankful. I don't care how it smells. I'm probably going to go down to Whataburger or In-N-Out or something <laughs> in protest. Because <laughs> that's the way I am. And, uh, and so I'm not going to appreciate that meal. Now, on the other hand, if she burnt the food, but I can see she's been working. She's actually trying to make this special meal. And she comes out, and I can see there's tears in her eyes. She's frustrated. She's crying. I wanted to make this dinner for you. I wanted you to know I appreciate you. I would, I would love that meal. Even though it was burnt, I, I would just be so filled up. Yeah, you, you, you said something to me. But it wasn't just the action. It was the heart behind the action. And that's one of the main things that I believe people miss when you talk about Christian growth. And so we talk about the need to be in the Word. We talk about the need to pray. But those are great. Those are powerful when you're in a loving relationship and you're pursuing the Lord. 
That's when they're powerful. That's when they produce a great fruit in that context of that relationship. And so as we talk about these things, that needs to stay uh, in, the, in the forefront of your mind as we're talking about a personal relationship. And our aim is to love him, to grow closer to him, and to enjoy being loved by him. And delighting in the fact that he loves us and wants us with him for eternity. Uh, we also talked about, then of course, about the word of God being spiritual food. Being spiritual food. And we looked at Matthew chapter 4, and we went back and we looked in Exodus as, and Deuteronomy as Jesus was comparing those things to the manna, uh, the manna that really speaks to the coming of Christ, and it's a supernatural food source that sustained the people after they're delivered from bondage so they got to the promised land, and that God has given us a supernatural food source. And he gave them quail at night, and he gave them manna in the morning. And I believe those are very clear symbolic that we should be in the word Every morning and every night. That's how we get stronger. We need a healthy diet. Because when we partake of the word, we partake of Christ. And so we looked at the pictures of a, of a healthy soldier. And we looked at the pictures of a Holocaust survivor. And I'll remind you, the Holocaust survivor was fed a bit burnt piece of toast and some kind of watered down soup. And they were, of course, incredibly weak. We could uh, clearly tell if we loaded them up with armor or, or gave them weapons, it would be of, of no effect, really, because they don't have the strength to use them. And, and that is what our soul potentially looks like if all you're living on is a burnt piece of toast and something like a watered-down soup for your spiritual diet. And so before we even get to the armor of God, before we go to those different parts, we have to first be healthy, to be strong. And part of being strong is listening to the Lord by opening the word. Every relationship needs communication. I can't get closer to my wife if I don't spend time with her. In that relationship, I need to talk and I need to listen. And so when we go to the word of God, we're getting fellowship with God and we need to listen. We need to hear what he has said. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that brings us now to part three, is quenching spiritual thirst. Now, these principles for Christian growth, everybody walks in them that is growing, whether or not they know it, right? Like we all function in a world that has gravity, whether or not we ever think about it. And everybody that grows in Christ walks within these principles. They're, they're walking in this relationship. They're trying to grow in their love for the Lord. They're going into the word with the right heart because they want it and they're taking it in. Uh, and they're praying and they're, they're seeking the spirit, but they're doing these things with the right heart, with the right motive. And you'll also find when people are not growing, that these are often the first spot you'll look and find an absence that they're not walking in these things. And, and of course, if we don't eat physically, if we don't drink spiritually, we're going to become weak very quickly. So we're going to open up to John chapter 4. Now, physical thirst can cause a lot of problems. If people are not well hydrated, uh, if you go to the gym or you go for a run or do physical exercise, it can actually hurt your body if you're not hydrated. Uh, you can actually do damage to yourself if you're not taking in enough water or leave yourself in worse shape, or in a worse condition. We lose water every day physically, whether or not we drink any. And so we need to constantly be hydrated. Physical dehydration carries some of the different symptoms. Uh, dry mouth, weakness, dizziness, fainting. Inability to sweat, confusion, sluggishness, headaches, seizures, difficulty breathing, and chest or abdominal pains. And so some of those little uh, things we hear there, I want to ask if you've ever felt those in your spiritual life. Have you ever felt that you were in a dry season? Have you ever felt spiritually weak, confused, fainting or sluggish, headaches, Difficulty breathing, chest or abdominal pains. You ever had something weighing heavy on your heart? We know there's nothing physically there, but you can feel that pressure. You ever had those different things? 
And we see that there's these parallels, again, between our spirit and the natural, that the Lord is using these things to teach us. And so those of us, by the grace of God, that have been saved, that have entered into this relationship with him, thankfully we have an abundance of water. And that's what we'll see here in John chapter 4. If you want to open up with me to verse 5. It says, So Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Sikar is another name for Shechem. It's a city, uh, of course, there in the, in the Middle East, not far from Jerusalem uh, in Samaria. And the name is only used here in the Bible. It's only called Sikar here. And the name means drunken. And so it's uh, the middle of the day, but we see here that in the place of drunkenness, Jesus is offering living water. It's a, the middle of the day is an odd time for a woman to be drawing water. That would not have been normal at this time. We know in the last chapter that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. We have that in John 3. Now, Nicodemus was uh, very influential. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher in Israel. He was incredibly wealthy from what we can read outside the text of, of the Bible. He was like a, uh, like a billionaire, basically, of the town. Very wealthy, very well off. And we saw Jesus give him the gospel, the need to be born again. This is a very different situation now as we get to the very next chapter. This woman is a Samaritan. Uh, she's been married five times. She's currently living with a guy that's not her husband. And we see Jesus talking to her. Now, to give you a little bit of context, too, for how strange even this conversation is, one, Jews didn't like Samaritans so much, they would walk around Samaria and take a three-day journey out of their way just to avoid seeing these people or being in their towns. Uh, and, the, and the real religious or pious Jews, they would walk around Samaria. Now, rabbis also at this time didn't talk to women in public like this, especially a woman like this. Some of the more religious rabbis wouldn't even talk to their own wife in public. So culturally, this is the, uh, as Jesus begins this conversation, that he's in this town is strange, uh, that he's willing to talk uh, to a woman is strange, and that he's willing to talk to a woman of this reputation is strange. Most likely by coming at noon, she is either avoiding the other women when they go out, or she is looking for a man. And so either way, her, her, she's obviously avoiding. And we know opposite of Nicodemus, who is very wealthy, if she's going out to draw her own water, she is most likely not very wealthy. And so we have a very big comparison here from John 3 to John 4. And the amazing thing that we should learn from that is the gospel is for everyone. It's for the Jew and it's for the Samaritan. It's for the wealthy and it's for the poor. It's for the religious and it's for the sinner. The gospel is for everyone. So verse 9, the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I love this about Jesus in this situation. Uh, is because he's using a normal situation to bring up the gospel. This is a wonderful example for us about ways to bring up the gospel. He opens up this conversation with the woman by just asking for some water. But I don't think his intentions or his main worries were ever about water. I think he was just beginning a dialogue so he could share the gospel. And that, how neat is that mindset? And I encourage you guys to take hold of that mindset and bring up conversations, bring up things where you can spin it to the gospel, to intentionally bring it up. And he said to her, if you knew the gift of God, a reference to himself and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, of course, that would follow. Verse 11, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. What well, Jesus, again, uh, here as he's shifting the things to spiritual now, makes it incredibly clear to the lady. He's not talking about normal water. He's not talking about the water there from that well. Of course, the answer is he is greater than Jacob. But he is talking here about a supernatural water that satisfies the soul and becomes in us a spring of water. He is talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, typically, water represents three things in the Word of God. It represents cleansing. It represents the Messiah, and it represents the Holy Spirit. All of those are fitting doctrinally right within this uh, uh, section we're at, we're at. We're all cleansed by the blood of Christ. We're made clean by Christ. He dwells in us, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We know that from Romans 8, Colossians 1, uh, Ephesians 1, 1 John 3, several references where we understand those things. So those are all fitting as far as uh, the things it represents. But we talked previously about the guarantee of our salvation is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 say. It says, In Jesus you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of God. Of his glory. The guarantee of your salvation is not that you acknowledge God as real, but that God lives in you. That is the greatest guarantee of your salvation, is that you have a relationship with him. James 2 talks about even the demons believe and tremble. How can you be sure? How can you have rest? How can you have security? It's because you know him. That is the, that is the guarantee of our salvation, is that the spirit of God is in us. And he refreshes and nourishes our soul. Uh, other ways you can know the Spirit of God's in you. Some encouragements. If he's ever encouraged you, if he's ever rebuked you, if he's ever taught you anything when he's provided direction to you, those are awesome things because they're evidence of a relationship. Those are good things. If those things are entirely absent, if you're going, I don't know if I've ever had any fellowship with the Spirit. Is there a reason to be concerned? Well, I like to be stamped guaranteed. <laughs> So I like having that guarantee, and that's our guarantee is that we know him. Just like, how do I know that I'm married? I have a marriage certificate. That's not really my guarantee. I know I'm married because I have a spouse, because I have a relationship. And, and so the same is true in our relationship with Christ. John chapter 7, as Jesus is talking, we'll pick up in verse 37. He says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the living water is clearly the Spirit. We're not guessing. It's not just my interpretation. We can see that right there from, from John as he records for us the teachings of Christ. And so then the question comes to us is, are you thirsty? Because if you are, Jesus said, come to me. And so how do we meet with God? Well, of course, the first thing is through Christ. But as followers of Christ, then we pray, we worship we fast. We seek him. These are some of the different things we can do. But are you dry this morning? Are you spiritually dry? Then I just have one question for that is how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? How is your fellowship, your time of communication between you and the Lord? The Holy Spirit refreshes our soul. When we are in fellowship with him, it is the perfect example of water. Let's turn over to John 14, where Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit. John 14, we'll pick up in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Here, of course, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit to dwell inside the believer the promise of the living water. This is a promise that carries into the next life. If you go read Revelation 21 and 22, this water for, uh, source that will refresh, uh, refreshes our soul, uh, the river flowing out in Revelation 22, flows from the throne of God. It is the Spirit of God. And you notice within this too, as we talked about that this is in the context of a relationship, how personal this passage is. I'm going to read a few of the personal parts. I'm going to cherry pick a few of the verses or the sections out of what we just read. But he starts with, if you love me, he may abide with you forever, to dwell with you forever. It says, you know him. He dwells with you and will be in you, a close, intimate, personal relationship. I will not leave you orphans. He says, I will come to you you will see me. That's a promise we have. We will see him face to face. Because I live, you will live also. And then he says, at that day, you'll know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Sounds a lot like a very personal relationship, doesn't it? It sounds like he's not talking just about some detached theological position or a religious system, he's talking very clearly about a personal relationship, one where he loves you and delights in you and wants you with him, and you love him back. That's what he's talking about right here. He says, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Well, of course, these things, as we just said, clearly imply a personal relationship. And he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words. Keep my words. You know, if we have unrepentant sin in our life, that can separate us from God. Proverbs 28, 9 says, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. We all struggle with sin. Unrepentant sin is something that we need to be... Uh, uh, on guard against. Unrepentant sin is when you don't stumble with something, but that you're telling God to stay out of it. When you're like, hey, God, I know you said this is bad, but you're wrong. It's good. And so I'm going to keep it. Okay. Stumbling is when you hate the sin, but you fall to it. You wrestle with it. And you're fighting against it, but you have still a sin nature. And so when I'm saying unrepentant sin, I mean sin that you're saying, hey, God, this isn't bad, and you can't have this section of my life. You should be very careful of that. That's a dangerous place to be. But what are the main commandments? Well, Jesus told us, as we read last week in John 6, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And the first and the second commandment, he also summed up very clearly, very simply, love God and love others. And so when you read those things, remember to think of those things within the context of this relationship. Do we believe in him? Do we love him? Do we love others? Even the answer of faith makes so much sense in a relationship. And when you talk to somebody, when you have a friendship, don't you want them to trust you? Isn't that a big deal to you? If you tell something to your spouse, isn't it a big deal that they believe you? That's a big deal to me. You know, if I told my wife I was stopping by the store, I don't want her sitting there going, really? Is that really where you were? Right? No, why wouldn't you believe me? If I told her I paid a bill, I don't want her to go, I don't know, I better double check. Now, of course, we can make mistakes. There's reasons sometimes to doubt us. Sometimes we give reasons for insecurity. But in the relationship with God, there's never reasons for insecurity. He's perfect on his end of the relationship. And so we should trust in him. We should have confidence in him. 
In both of our past studies, we went back to the book of Numbers and the book of Exodus. And we're going to go back and we're going to look at them again. We're going to go back to Exodus chapter 17. A brief summary again, if you weren't here the last few weeks, is the Jewish people were in slavery in Egypt. When God sent Moses to deliver the people, he delivered them by many signs and wonders, leading them out of captivity through the Red Sea with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day, now leading the people. When they are freed from bondage, but not to the promised land yet, God continued to do more miracles for these people, including the quail at night and manna and bread each morning. That's what we talked about last week and water flowing from the rock. That's what we're going to pick up right now. These uh, parallels, of course, are for us to understand, for us to learn. And they're given by intent. They're both real history and theological paintings at the same time. It's one of the works of God. And to me, it's one of the fingerprints of God that he puts on his word. As you find these things throughout his word, is that he takes real people, real situations, real history, and yet he paints beautiful theology and weaves it in. And so for picture's sake, to bring us up to speed, Exodus 14 was the crossing of the Red Sea. Exodus 15, the Israelites journey for three days into the wilderness and come to Marah. And in Marah, the water is bitter, so the people complain to Moses. Moses goes to God, and he shows him a tree. And when Moses casts into the water, their water is made sweet. Now they can drink it. We'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Exodus 16 is the giving of quail at evening and manna in the morning, which primarily represents Jesus in his word. Uh, we know that again from... Uh, from John 1, from Exodus 17, from Matthew 4, from Deuteronomy 8, and 1 Corinthians 10 would be references where we know that, that that's not my opinion. It's what the Word of God states. And then in Exodus 17, we have water from the rock. Why the order? Because we have the deliverance from the bondage of sin, the sacrificial land, the Passover, where they're delivered and in a sense baptized through the Red Sea. The water being made drinkable, the ability to partake of the goodness of God. Before the cross, we didn't have the ability to partake of the Spirit of God, to drink. Then we have quail and bread from heaven, a supernatural food source that's given to sustain the people, and then water from the rock. I think there's a reason also that the quail and the bread came before the water. We'll come back to that later. But we're going to pick up in Exodus 17, verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you will strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contentions of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, man, that is a packed passage. We're only going to grab a few things out of it. The first question I want to ask is, have you ever felt the way the people are right here in your spiritual walk? Here they are very discontent with God. We find that they are very dramatic through this journey. And, uh, and we find really that the church is pretty dramatic through its journey. So again, the parallels fit perfect. But they're contending against Moses. They're discontent. They're frustrated. Hey, we got delivered out of this past stuff. Life's supposed to be good. Why do we still have needs? Why do we have hardships? Why do we need to depend on the Lord? And they don't like it. So much so that they're almost ready to stone Moses. Can leave sometimes where we see the same thing where Christians can, can think, why don't I just stay in my old lifestyle? 
We, we see those things happen. People ask these same questions. So I encourage you to search here and see if you find yourself, and if you do, repent. But the people were very discontent with the mediator God had appointed. And the other thing for us is don't ever grow discontent with Christ. Don't ever let a heart of hate grow towards Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us all these happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So as we're reading these things, these things are recorded for us, for our learning. So we don't repeat the same mistakes. And also to testify of God's goodness. Because what we see here is God in his amazing grace provides. He still provides for these people. And God told Moses to take the staff, the same staff that turned the water into blood in Egypt. And, uh, and to strike the rock. God, these people had seen all these miracles. They had seen the plagues poured out on Egypt. They had seen God part the sea. They are eating the bread that rains down from heaven. And it's a lesson for us, too, about how quickly we can forget the goodness of God. We hit one hard patch, and it's like, oh, God, where are you? But we don't look back on our lives and say, God has been faithful. Why do we doubt? Why are we so afraid that he's going to abandon us now. And so these are good lessons for us. So he tells him to strike the, lock and f- strike the rock and from it the water would flow. And this is, of course, a picture for us in that Christ is the rock. Christ was struck. And after he was struck, the spirit flowed. The spirit became available to us. And so flip with me to Numbers chapter 20. So this here in Exodus 17, this is towards the beginning of their journey out of of Exodus. I'm thinking that we're only about uh, around two-month mark or so around Exodus 17. We're not very far, maybe not even that far. And and so very close. And we get to Numbers chapter 20, we're getting closer to the end of the journey. And so we're going to pick up in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died with our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought us up, the assembly of the Lord, into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? Sound familiar? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. Now, if you recall, the people are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they lack the faith to go into the promised land. That's why they're in the wilderness. And God has supernaturally provided for them the whole time. But they want the promised land. And, you know, the same thing can happen with believers. They place place their faith in Christ. God's promised them eternity. He's promised them paradise. And they want paradise on earth. I don't want to wait. I don't want to go through trials. I don't want to fight any different enemies. I just want to inherit the blessing now. And that's, I think, what we see with these people. They were very discontent that there was a journey in between. That there was these times where there was these tests of faith. Be careful. Be careful. Remember God's promises of all this goodness. They're ahead for us. He didn't promise us perfect lives here on earth. He promised us eternity with him. That's what he promised us. So here again we see that years of provision. And now again a few hard days and the people are losing their faith. But God is still faithful. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And they fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron. Gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes. And you will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water from them out of the rock. And give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord. Uh, from before the Lord as he commanded him. So last time Moses was to strike the rock. Now he's told very specifically, speak to the rock. 
This is a huge thing as far as the picture goes. Why? Because Christ was struck for our sins, and then the Spirit flowed. But how do we get it now? We speak to it. By faith, Lord, please save me, and the Spirit flows. We don't strike the rock. Christ isn't crucified every time somebody gets saved. He was struck, and now it's spoken by faith. Now, Moses goes ahead and strikes the rock, if you recall, and he gets in huge trouble. He says, hey, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. Moses, who's been this faithful leader following the Lord, he gets this huge punishment for this act of disobedience. And if you don't understand the picture, you're like, why? All he did was strike a rock. What's the big deal? The big deal is, is he got ink on God's painting. That's the big deal. Uh, God was painting this picture about the gospel, and Moses was messing it up. God, because he's sovereign, because he's amazing, actually creates this other beautiful picture. Don't mess with the gospel, or you'll be kept out, even if you're Moses. Now, Moses is in heaven, but he creates this beautiful picture. And, he pro and by giving Moses this strong rebuke, the picture becomes incredibly clear. And so even though Moses spills a little ink on the, on the photo, God, who is a master painter, cleans it right up and makes it part of the picture. And so we see this picture here then that is, that is woven in. So what do you speak to the rock for the, for the spirit to flow? Lord, save me. Lord, I believe in you. I need you. I trust in you. Please cleanse me from my sin. Lord, please teach me to walk in your ways. Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I need your help. We aren't given this specific word because I think it's much more about the heart. There's not a magic phrase that somebody can repeat. It's a crying out to the rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. It says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. These pictures that I'm sharing with you, again, as you see here, these aren't my pictures. These are God's pictures. He says clearly the rock was Christ. Something amazing that we don't get in the Old Testament, at least I don't see it anywhere, that Paul tells us is the rock followed them around. The rock followed them around in the wilderness. And so they actually had a supply the whole time. That's incredible. But also notice what he calls them, spiritual food, spiritual drink. This is, this is very Jewish, all these pictures, and there's no way that Paul would have missed it. And we see, of course, that he is referencing those things and telling them these are recorded for our benefit. These are our examples, became our examples. Examples of what to do and what not to do, and examples of God's faithfulness. So Jesus is the rock. If we want to be refreshed, we need to go to the rock. We need to go to Christ. Having a spring of water or a limitless supply, that's a wonderful gift. It's a great thing to have. Living in America, we can take clean drinking water for granted. It's easy. We go to our tap. We buy it in the bottles. It's cheap. It's easily accessible. It's even free at restaurants. Uh, they say there's over 1 billion people in the world that don't have access to clean water. There's a lot of people. Is that around the little over 12% or so of the population don't have access to safe, clean drinking water? But here's a shocking statistic. Uh, it's uh, from dripdrop.com. They did a survey of over 3,000 people in America and found out that 75% of Americans are chronically dehydrated. We don't have a water shortage in America. We don't have a problem with clean, safe drinking water in America. But three out of four people are constantly dehydrated. I'm one of them. I don't drink enough water. Uh, if water was coffee, I would be fine. <laughs> but um, I don't drink enough water. I will often wake up in the middle of the night and have to go get water. 
I usually keep water by my bed. I'll usually drink the whole glass before I wake up the next night. Uh, but my throat's dry. Sometimes I wake up, I have to get a second glass. What's my problem? It's not supply. It's that I don't take advantage of it throughout the day and drink it and keep my body hydrated. That's my problem. I have a wonderful supply. And God in his grace, he supplied an abundance of food and he supplied an abundance of water. But we still have to eat and we still have to drink. I'm also blessed that I got a kitchen full of food. I'm much more faithful about eating than I'm about drinking. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I don't like to miss meals if I don't have to. But having a kitchen full of food doesn't, doesn't satisfy your hunger. It isn't until you go in and you prepare something and you consume it that it satisfies your soul. And just having a Bible on the shelf doesn't nourish the soul. It might have all the food you need to sustain your soul from here to eternity, but if you don't open it, and you don't consume it, it won't feed you. And if you open it and you read it, but your mind's somewhere else, it still won't nourish the soul. Just like going to the kitchen and opening the fridge and not taking anything else, don't feed the stomach. We have to take it in. And so we have within us a limitless supply of water, and we have in our possessions the Word of God. To nourish our souls every day and every night. So if we're weak or if we're dehydrated, it's not because God has failed to supply that which we need. The only way that we could be spiritually hungry or spiritually dry is if we're not eating or not drinking from the well. So how do we do that? How do you drink spiritual water? Turn over to Luke chapter 10 with me if you would. Pick it up in verse 38. It says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. You know, we can sometimes think that if we're busy serving God, that should refresh us and that should nourish our soul. If we're just actively serving other people. And serving is good. It's an important part. But, but that serving is supposed to be an overflow from what we're receiving from our relationship with the Lord. Not, not neglecting our time with Him. Again, it's a relationship, right? You might appreciate it if your spouse does things for you, but you want your spouse to spend time with you. You need to have that personal time needs to come first. And Martha here, she's not happy that her sister's not helping her, that she's sitting there at the feet of Jesus. She's like, Jesus, tell her to come help me. And it says, he said to her, you are worried and troubled about many things. Worried and troubled about many things. You know, I think about that back to John 4, right? And the, uh, drunken is the idea here of having an unsober mind. Right, just this, this full of distractions, it's full of different things, compared to a spiritually sober, soberly minded, where we can see clearly, where we can discern clearly. It says, you are worried and troubled about many things. You know, a mind not fixed on the Lord is easily distracted. It's all over the place. It's hard to grab a hold of your thoughts. When I was a kid, I went to a museum, and they had a, a, a video game thing you could drive of, this is what it's like to drive like under the influence. You guys ever done one of those? And everything's all delayed and the screen blacks out sometimes and you have to try not to crash. Because everything's delayed. And you know, when, when we're, our focus is wrong, if we're drinking from different things, if we're drinking but not from the Spirit of God, we're just drinking up the things of the world, it can be difficult to have a sober mind, to think right, to think properly. And you could end up filled with worries and troubles. 
even if you're busy serving, but just distracted on all these other things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part and will not be taken away from her. Well, what did she do? She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That's what she did. You think she was refreshed in that time? Yeah. You know, someone once said, you cannot give what you do not have. And if we want to share the Spirit of God, if we want to minister to others, we have to first learn to be filled. And that's a lesson here that Martha was learning. You got to first sit at the feet of Christ before you go worrying about the ministry. How do we do this? Well, we do it through several ways, but probably the main way is through prayer. Uh, Worship can be other ways, uh, fasting, but spending time with the Lord. But what's different about this prayer than normal prayers? We have a lot of time we pray that we're asking for things or we're intercessory prayer where we're praying for other people. Those are good things. Uh, It's okay to ask God. If you have a, um, a financial issue, should you pray about it? Should you take it to the Lord? Yes, you should. If there's a health issue, if your parents or your kids or a friend or a loved one is sick, should you take them before the Lord? Should you intercede on their behalf? If they're in a hard season, absolutely, you should pray and intercede for that person. But you also need time of fellowship prayer. Fellowship prayer. That's where you're there to be with him. Now, again, I'm going to bring this back to a relationship. It's all right, and it's good if your spouse asks you for help with different things, right? It's okay if something's wrong with my wife's car. If she says, hey, honey, something's wrong with the car. Can you fix it? That's good. I'm her husband. I can. Yes, I'll take care of that for you. Uh, it's okay if we're asking for favors. We're asking for help in a relationship. You're allowed to do that. If you need uh, help uh, around the house with different things, or different, it's okay to ask your friends. It's okay to ask your loved ones. But we also know we don't, we don't appreciate it when that's all the relationship is, right? Nobody appreciates it when all the time somebody's calling, you know the only thing they want is help, just a favor. They're never looking to hang out. They're always looking, can you do this? Can you do that? And the same is true in marriage. We're happy to serve each other, but we don't want our relationship to only be service, right? We also want time of intimacy. We also want time of fellowship. We also want time to sit on the couch and enjoy each other or go do things together in life as a friends, as friendship. And the same is true in our relationship with God. God wants fellowship time with you. Yeah, lay all your requests before him. But also make time where you just go to be with him. Just to be in his presence, to delight in him, to pour out just your thankfulness to him, to worship him, to sit at his feet and listen. Fellowship prayer. And this is a key part. And, and in those times, we are re- refreshed, just like drinking water. It, it refreshes our soul. Have you ever spent time in the presence of God? Whether it's in worship, whether it's in your closet, on your knees, but where the Lord's speaking to you, you're in that fellowship with him. And can't you testify that your spirit was refreshed in that time? Didn't it feel like a dehydrated soul that just got a big glass of water? That's what it felt like. Well, of course it felt like that because that's exactly what you got, some spiritual water. And so we need to make time to have time alone with the Lord. So how often should we pray? Well, the word tells us we should pray without ceasing. Uh, Luke 18, Jesus spoke a parable to them. and says that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. We should pray throughout the day. We talked about eating. Eating, we have meal times. Getting in the word, reading the word, we have meal times. Praying is something we should learn to do throughout the day. And again, it's okay to intercede, but it also you should have times where you just throughout the day, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I love you, Lord. Where you should set your mind to him, where you're thinking of him. Lord, I want to be more like you. Thank you for saving me. I just want to spend time in your presence. This should be a regular part of our, of our thoughts throughout the day. And whenever you take a drink of normal water, I encourage you to let it be a reminder to talk and listen for the Lord. To be talking to him throughout the day. I'd also encourage you to set aside about three to five minutes every morning with your devotions where you have fellowship prayer with the Lord. Fellowship prayer, 
where you're there to delight in him and just to be with him. You can pour out thankfulness if it's difficult for you to, to uh, focus your thoughts. A prayer journal can be a big help if you're, if you're a very easily distracted mind. But within those things, what I want to encourage you is that you dedicate that time where it's not your wish list prayer. It's your fellowship time. It's your time where you're just expressing your love to the Lord and enjoying being loved by him. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for your promises towards me. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you that I'm redeemed. Thank you that you're perfect. Thank you that you're faithful. Just sit there with him and let his spirit minister to you and you will be refreshed. If you do these different things, you will grow. And again, as I said earlier, anybody who's growing in the Lord does these things, even if they don't understand these pictures. We're going through the pictures because I want you to understand when you're spiritually hungry, eat. And when you're spiritually thirsty, drink. You know, when you have little kids sometimes, especially like when you take kids to camp, you have to make them drink. Right? They will, they will end up uh, in the nurse's station all the time. Every time you go to camp, it, it never fails. There's always kids that go to the nurse's station. And what do they need? Water. Now, adults, you know that, right? When you get thirsty, if you go out and you're like, I don't feel so good. You've been running a mile and a half. And you're like, yeah, I haven't drank water yet today. You put two and two together. But kids, they don't put the two and two together. They've been running out in the sun all day. They're dehydrated and they don't know what's going on. And so the purpose of going through these things is I want you to understand when you're spiritually hungry, you need to eat. And when you're spiritually thirsty, you need to drink. And how often should you be in these things? Daily. You need to eat food every day. How often should you be drinking? Daily. Throughout the day. You need to drink. How long? Forever. Just like physically. <laughs> it never stops. And so these physical comparisons, they are literal for us to understand the needs for our soul and the provisions God has provided. With that also, I want to encourage you, never count these gifts as common. Remember when we started, when Jesus spread the gospel, gave the gospel to Nicodemus in Numbers 21, and the, and the people, uh, they were complaining against God, they're complaining against Moses, and they said, there's nothing to hate, eat, and we hate this worthless bread, and there's nothing to drink. There was plenty of food to eat. They just said they hated it. And there was water to drink. We know because in Numbers 20, the water came out of the rock. And the rock followed them. So there was something to drink. They wanted something else. Never count these gifts as common. Don't despise them and desire something else. There's a powerful picture for us there. Revelation chapter 22. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. In the churches, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Amen to that. We have a limitless supply that has been given to us by the grace of God. Amen. What an awesome God we serve that he has sustained and refreshes our souls. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for our time this morning. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would never despise these gifts, that we would never count them as common, that we would never treat them as common. Lord, I pray, Father, for everyone here in this congregation. Lord, I pray, Father, that they would be disciplined to feed their soul daily to open your word every morning and every night, not because they just want to be religious people, but because they're in a relationship with you and they want to hear from you every morning and every night because they love you. Lord, I pray, Father, for faithfulness to meet on our knees. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would 
listen, talk to you throughout the day. Laying every request and need before you, but also, Lord, just delighting in you as our Savior, our Redeemer, the one we get to dwell with forever. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love you every day and to delight in your love. Lord, thank you so much for your gracious provisions. Thank you, Lord, for the seal of your Holy Spirit upon us that we may know that we belong to you. So, Lord, help us to drink, to be satisfied in you, to be refreshed, and to never grow discontent with these gifts, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these gifts that will sustain us, Lord, till you call us home and even through eternity. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. From creation to the cross, there from the cross into eternity, your